Hello and welcome back. It's me, uh, Mr. Horton, and as you know, and today we're talking about imperialism, alliances, and war, part two. Um, we uh, have added a couple of things to our entourage of the textbook. Good shape, yeah. The uh, pen, the uh, study guide, and the Coke Zero. I also now have added hand sanitizer and Kleenex because I've been uh, uh, sneezing like you would not believe. I feel like I have a bee stuck up my nose somewhere. And uh, it's been quite the, <clears throat> quite the uh, irritation. But yes, welcome back. Uh, this actually is uh, a video for Tuesday um, tomorrow, but I'm going to put it on today anyway in case I want to work on other things tomorrow, as well as I'll be sending you, as you know, your cooperative take-home test. Tomorrow, I think I'm going to start uh, getting help on figuring out this thing called Mastery Connect, you know, uh, so that I can give you all tests. Sorry. I mean, I know I'm a traitor, but yeah. Anyway, so let's talk about uh, this current unit uh, where we got cut off. Um, this, uh, we talked about the white man's burden uh, a little bit. Yes. Uh, the white man, uh, there were other motivations for imperialism, such as religious, cultural, and social imperialism. We've already talked about the white man's burden. Um, you know, the biggest thing about the white man's burden is this, you know, this idea of the white man's burden. Uh, and I've said this to some other classes, was that, you know, this idea that it is the white man's burden to care for his little brown brothers, a entirely racist ideology, uh, you know, from the word go, the idea that, uh, people who are not white need somebody else to look, need somebody else to look after them, need somebody else to manage their affairs, need somebody else to manage their resources. Um, the most amazing thing about that is that it was an idea that was proffered not by people who were ignorant, not by um people who went around wearing the, the white hoods and things like that. Uh, it was the ideas of the intelligentsia, of the intellectuals who went around saying that, hey, it's the white man's job to uh, take care of people who weren't white. And by take care of them, that also meant to uh, educate them, to uplift them, and yes, to manage the diamonds under their feet in South Africa, or the palm oil from the palm oil plantations in Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yes, that was the white man's burden. The religious groups also demanded that Western governments furnish political and even military support for Christian missionary expeditions. In Germany, some suggested that foreign intervention would divert attention away from local and domestic issues of the day. Uh, I could see Kaiser Wilhelm II uh, being a big proponent of that. Otto von Bismarck, uh, no. But Kaiser Wilhelm II, the idea of Germany, he wanted Germany to have a colonial empire so that they would be like the British, which he was obsessed with. Uh, in Britain, Joseph Chamberlain, the colonial secretary from 1895-1903, suggests that foreign co colonies would finance a great program of domestic reform and welfare. In other words, this, this empire as a source of profit. And then, of course, you have people like uh, Cecil Rhodes, who is often utilized a lot in AP Euro exams. Cecil Rhodes, uh, R-H-O-D-E-S, Cecil, R-O-R-H-O-D-E-S, Cecil Rhodes. Uh, the owner of the De Beers Diamond Corporation, the uh, person who, uh, for whom the 
colony later on country of Rhodesia was named for. Cecil Rhodes, who said that he wanted to see a red line stretch from Cairo to Cape Town, Cairo, Egypt, Cape Town, South Africa. And that red line meant British properties, uh, a telegraph, a railroad that was stretched from the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Alex, uh, from uh, Cairo to Cape Town, South Africa, connecting all of Africa under uh, British domination. That's what he wanted to see. Um, so yes, that, that Africa, and other colonies would operate for profit. Sorry, but yeah, right. Uh, <clears throat> some thought that colonies would provide a place for the surplus population, which so many of the cities of Europe were beginning to produce to migrate, even though most ended up going to the Americas or Australia, places that were already heavily settled by Europeans. Okay, Roman numeral four. Uh, let me introduce you to a new idea. Maybe it's not new, but the game Monopoly. Have you ever played the game Monopoly? Or perhaps Risk, uh, or, you know, that uh, Milton Bradley board game. In both of them, uh, the objective is fairly similar. And that is to acquire not only the most property, but the strategic properties, the pro properties that are strategically located, the properties that other peoples, other players in the game would need. Uh, for example, uh, when Russia began making incursions, I'm going to blow my nose, if you'll excuse me. <coughs> Forgive me. Yes, Wharton Live. Sorry, Tom Ritchie. Uh, when Russia began showing interest in northern Iran, the British, to counter that interest, acquired southern Iran and to block the Russians from getting uh, access to the Persian Gulf. And so, yeah. Um, sorry. Where was that? Yes. Um, surplus population. All right. Uh, Africa, though, was the best and most used example. Before the Great Scramble of 1878, before the Great Scramble of 1878 for African land holdings, Britain was the only European power that held large land holdings. Uh, the completion of the Suez Canal, though, made this very important to Britain as it set the shortest route from India to Britain. Under Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, Great Britain purchased a large but not controlling interest, stock interest in the uh, Panama, or, sorry, the Suez Canal. However, when domestic problems arose in the Suez Canal, uh, the British took it over. Those Brits, you can always count on them in the clutch. They took it over. Uh, uh, took, they took over the Su Sudan then to protect the canal. And, you know, I just simply say they took it over. Um, you know, there was a, a Muslim insurgency uh, in the Sudan, in Khartoum. Uh, but that's, uh, it was actually the subject of a DBQ that they had about 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, France then became involved in Africa when it tried to attack the Barbary pirates in 1830. You might be saying, who are the Barbary pirates? Uh, on the northern coast of Africa, the Mediterranean Sea, on the Barbary coast. Uh, there was this group of uh, people that now li would be living in Libya who made a living uh, by simply preying on uh, foreign shipping, seizing shipping, and piracy, end of story. And the French, uh, in order to control them and to protect its shipping, actually attacked the Barbary pirates and becomes entrenched in North Africa and begins, if you look on your map, on page 706 in your textbook, 706 in your textbook. How's that for high tech, Tom? 706 in your textbook. The French become entrenched uh, in uh, North Africa, creating several colonies. So, um, so by the 1880s, France was in full control of Algeria, then annexed Tunisia to keep it away from the Italians. The French also annexed much of West Africa, 
the Congo, and the island of Madagascar. Yeah, I know Madagascar, but I giggled because it's a Disney cartoon. I don't know why. Uh, anyway, smaller states like Belgium in the Congo and Portugal, Spain, and Italy were carving out their own colonies. Um, there is a video, uh, educational video, about the Belgian experience in the Congo. I mean, normally, and I'm one of them, I actually would like to go to Belgium one day um, because it's uh, one of the places in Europe that really wasn't bombed that much by World War II. And of course, you hear all sorts of cultural attractiveness about Belgium, such as Belgian chocolate, such as Belgian waffles. And you actually do know that Belgium is the place where French fries were invented. But uh, the Belgians under King Leopold III of Belgium were some of the most notoriously cruel Europeans in their conquest and ownership of the Belgian Congo. And so, uh, yeah, one normally doesn't think about that. Yeah. In fact, the Belgians were so cruel and and caused so much resentment in uh, what we now call the Congo that when the Congo, and we'll talk about this much later on, when the Congo um, overthrew, kicked out its Belgian colonizers in 1962, it was a vicious, uh, vicious reprisal. I remember reading about it when I was a young child uh, about uh, Western missionaries living in the Congo who were assaulted um, by the so-called Simbas. Um, yeah, and it was just a bloody revolt that uh, eventually the, uh, the, Bel the uh, Belgians withdrew from the Congo. And now there is an independent republic of the Congo. Um, but however, I do want to make this point uh, while we're talking about Africa. Today, the most violent continent on the planet easily is Africa. And why is it the most violent continent on the planet? And um, whose fault is it? If it's anybody, is it the Belgians' fault? Uh, well, it's Europeans' fault, you know, because basically, and here's the thing, at the Congress of Berlin of 1878, which we'll get to, uh, they basically sat down and they pulled up a big map of Africa and the European country said, you take that, you take that, you take that. They created, basically, they created the countries that are Africa in 1878. And you say, okay, so, well, what they did, they created these countries by drawing uh, lines, drawing boundary lines across um, tribal lines. And what that did it took these tribes who had existed, uh, I won't say peacefully, but they had existed harmoniously, we'll say, harmoniously in Africa uh, for centuries. And by creating, cutting across their tribal lines, they created artificial minorities in country A and artificial majorities in country B. Uh, this... Uh, this uh, will this will uh, be illustrated if you ever seen the film Hotel Rwanda, uh, when the uh, the Netherlands pulled out of Rwanda, um, there was I think it was, I always get the two mixed up Hutus Tutsis, but anyway one had been well treated by the belt by the Dutch because they were lighter skin. And the other had been mistreated by the Dutch because they weren't lighter skin. And then after the uh, uh, after the uh, Belgians got out, uh, they uh, the two tribes took revenge against each other. It was a horrible thing. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. Uh, so let's begin. Um, Where was I? Um, yes, yes, yes. So anyway, um, built Britain expanded its holdings northward from South Africa towards uh, Cairo. 
Uh, France and other nations did not have any reason for acquiring land holdings, except the possibility, this political status of colonial ownership, perhaps being able to block the British, uh, et cetera. In uh, Germany, Otto von Bismarck seemed to have pursued colonies for pure political reasons. Germany declared much of Africa as its protectorates, Cameroon, Namibia, Tanzania, even though those colonies had no real value of their own right. Um, they just acquired them. Notice it says Shout at the Devil. That's a reference to a film. They acquired them to block the British. Bismarck acquired colonies chiefly to improve Germany's diplomatic bargaining status uh, in Europe. He, Bismarck, hoped that colonial expansion would divert French hostility against Germany. Uh, also, he hoped that the African colonies in German possession would persuade the British to be more reasonable with the Germans. All right, Roman number five. Germany's annexations then started a wild scramble to snap up what was left of Africa. Much of the motive for this was simply to acquire power for its own sake. Just like playing Monopoly, it really is. Uh, as for Asia, Japan's growth as a military and colonial power alarmed the other European nations, particularly Russia. Now, I'm not sure how much we've talked about Japan. And I mean, one thing we notice here in modern European history in the latter part of the 19th in the early part of the 20th century, and especially after World War II, that European history becomes more and more, um, more and more world history. It really does. Uh, and things that happen all over the world, Europe is involved in, and so therefore we have to make reference to them. Uh, so the Japanese uh, had existed in pretty much isolation from the 15th century until 1853. And in 1853, the Japanese, um, after being, uh, well, the United States wanted to trade with Japan, and the Japanese weren't trading, and they didn't want to trade. The Japanese thought that Westerners, particularly Christianity, contaminated their culture. And so the Americans said, we'd like to trade with you guys. And so this is what they did. The United States sailed a flotilla of uh, warships, painted all white, into Tokyo Harbor and began bombarding the hillsides of Tokyo and then disembarked a significantly large contingent of American Marines who then forced their way through Tokyo right up to the palace of the Japanese emperor, forced their way in, and just when the emperor thought that they were all going to be annihilated, they began giving the emperor of Japan gifts. Gifts from the West. Books, spectacles, microscopes. They even built a little tiny railroad inside the imperial palace so the imperial court could ride around and around like you would at an amusement park. But, you know, and they said, you know, we can look. We can, uh, we can, uh, we can do this for you. The Japanese became so impressed by this combination of threat because the Americans just walked right in there and uh, generosity that they, the Japanese said, we have to catch up. And so in what is called the Meiji Restoration, uh, the Japanese began this pro program of modernization, which literally confounds the rest of the world. They the Japanese sent teams of observers all over the world uh, to find out how the rest of the world did things. They, of course, they wanted to know how the British had such a modern Navy and they sent observers to tail them. Uh, they sent observers to Germany or Prussia at the time to uh, just learn about how to run an army. Uh, they sent, uh, they actually sent observers into the United States to learn about the American educational system. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, manufacturing Great Britain, things of that nature. And so, yeah. But the amazing thing was, was the speed at which they were able to do this not only confounded the rest of the world, it made the rest of the world afraid. Why? Because it was one thing for the British to go around and dominate the globe. And by the way, that was also 
the Japanese also wanted to learn how to build a colonial empire. And as we're going to find out, they copied the British. They copied the British uh, image of a colonial empire. And um, they really did a good job of copying it. But see, that's the difference. You know, the rest of the world, the European world, the white world, looking at the British, um, doing that, it was like, oh, well, the British are just, they're civilizing those people that they're robbing. But when the Japanese began doing the same thing, and it was exactly the same thing, uh, suddenly the press calls the Japanese the yellow peril. And yeah, so anyway, Back to the matter at hand. Um, so, yeah, Russia really feared Japanese expansion. They feared that they, the Russians, would lose access to exploiting China. I mean, they can't be blocked by the Japanese. They want to exploit China. Uh, the Russians, along with France and Germany, forced Japan out of Laotong Peninsula and Port Arthur. The United States, uh, who uh, for once played the good guy, yeah, in this exploitation of uh, the Far East, in this exploitation of China, the uh, the Russians played the good guy, or rather the United States played the good guy, proffering what was called the open door policy. And the open door policy was simply this. Um, hey, guys, why don't we just all trade with China equally? Let's not have any spheres of influence. Let's not have any most favored nations. Let's just, the person, the country that has the best deal for the Chinese, then they get to trade with them. All nations agreed to this eventually, except for the Russians. Anyway, the United States, part seven, had only recently emerged as a world power. Uh, they had just, uh, in 1776, remember, to 1783, they gained freedom from Great Britain. Uh, they really enter the world stage when they published the Monroe Doctrine, which actually forced the British to uh, force the Brit. Uh, sorry, Monroe Doctrine, which uh, the British enforced. Sorry, I get distracted. Cuban revolts versus Spain then caused the United States, who sympathized with the Cubans, thinking they were little George Washingtons, uh, as well as the United States' economic dependence upon sugar to actually intervene in Cuba. And this will begin uh, an American act of imperialism called the Spanish-American War. And that's what it was. Uh, basically, the United States uh, picked a fight with Spain, a fledgling power, beat them up like they stole something, and then in the end took away all their toys. And those toys being Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Philippines, uh, and some other possessions. But yeah, it's, it's imperialism, uh, and it was based on sugar. Spanish-American War solidified, though, the United States as a world power. Germany then bought other Spanish-Pacific uh, possessions, and the United States uh, divided, and Germany, the United States and Germany divided Samoa, uh, and there's two islands, Samoas. There's northern Samoa and uh, and low and southern Samoa. The United States took southern Samoa, and the Germans took northern Samoa. Between them, by the turn of the 20th century, though, most of the world had come under the control or influence of the West. That's pretty obvious. The Ottoman Empire, however, will remain that question all the way through World War One. Okay, the creation and unification of the German Empire upset the balance of power uh, that had been established by the Congress of Vienna. Britain still retained its position as number one on Navy and a strong power, but see, Britain was able to interfere in uh, European affairs basically when it wanted to, and when it didn't want it to, it could stay out. Uh, but that British uh, role had been, you know, damaged by the, its performance in the Crimean War. So Austria was now being threatened by a meltdown of nationalism uh, from the various ethnic groups in their society. French power and prestige were greatly also hurt by the Franco-Prussian War, 
and the loss of the Alsace-Lorraine. All this stuff we went over, okay? Uh, the French were both ashamed of their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War and resentful of the loss of territory, not along with being quite afraid of their new and powerful neighbor, the Germans. All right, Roman numeral nine. Otto von Bismarck had a great deal to do with the ascension of Germany as a European world power. Uh, the Franco-Prussian War is a great example. Um, Uh, he said, though, that in 1871, Germany was satisfied with, in other words, there would be no more foreign excursions, no more territorial wars, and he meant it. Otto von Bismarck, after the war was over with, actually tried to reconcile with the French, you know, to make nice. He did not want a constant enemy on his uh, western border. However, if he could not reconcile with the French, which he couldn't, he intended to keep France isolated from other friends. I mean, come on, think about it. Uh, you know, you're in your little group at uh, Ryle, and you and one of your friends in your group have a disagreement. What's the first thing you do? You go to other members of the group and go, did, 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 did. did you hear what he said? Did, did, did. And you start saying what a bad person he is. Well, that's what Otto von Bismarck did. He wanted to isolate France away from the rest of the community in Europe. Um, Bismarck then sought to keep France from joining together with any other nation, particularly Russia or Austria, that would threaten Germany with a war on two fronts. Bismarck saw this coming. Bismarck saw World War I coming. In fact, his dying words, uh, Bismarck's dying words on his deathbed was that this thing, this war, where we're going to have to fight a major enemy on our western border and on our eastern border is coming. But Bismarck actually worked to prevent that, and he was actually fairly successful. Bismarck established by friendships with the Austrian emperor and the Russian czar a, an alliance called Der Drei Kaiserbund. Once you see it written there, uh, for the you German students, Der means the Drei Kaiserbund, Three Kings League, with Russia and Austria. The League soon collapsed as a result of Russian-Austrian rivalry after the Russo-Turkish War of 1875. Ah, uh, yes. We already know what the Eastern uh, question was. I know we do. What to do about the Ottoman Empire? We know that, and you should remember, Ottoman Empire is the sick man of Europe, meaning that the Ottoman Empire was not only a, a nuisance to other countries being because of the revolts that kept brewing uh, in the Ottoman Empire and spilling out into other countries, spilling out into their commerce, but also the Ottoman Empire couldn't, uh, it couldn't control its own entities. It was sick. It just, nobody could step forward and put it out of its misery without once again upsetting the balance of power. Ottoman weaknesses encouraged the spread of rebellions and the Russians wanted to help those rebellions. Uh, yes, the Pan-Slavic movement. Please remember, we already talked about this, the Pan-Slavic movement, it's the idea that there would be one Slavic nation, a nation made up of all the Slavic peoples of Europe, a nation that would have uh, been the largest nation in Europe had it come to pass. Highly impractical, but the idea of having all Russians, all Poles, all Serbs, all Czechs, all Slovaks, all Slovenes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in one nation. Uh, that, was, uh, that was frightening to the Austrian Empire. Never going to happen. Simply, for one thing, it's simply impractical because you have pockets of Slavs scattered out all over Europe, just like you have pockets of Germans at this time. Part D. The Ottoman Empire signed the Treaty of San Stefano, which was a Russian high water mark that ended the, uh, Ru the uh, Russo Turkish War of 1875. Slavic states in the Balkans were freed of Ottoman control. Russia gained territory. Russia also was paid uh, a reparation indemnity. Other European nations were now frightened by the prospect of a Russian takeover of the Dardanelles. I mean, that was what Russia wanted. Russia wanted the Dardanelles. Russia wanted uh, that territory uh, between the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea. 
And that prospect frightened all countries of Europe, including Great Britain. It was the last thing they wanted to see. And so many countries were will it ready and willing to go to war against the Russians to prevent that. Which leads us to that question, what is a jingo? G-I-N-G-O. 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 Jingo was his name. Oh, it's not that, trust me. Uh, actually, though, the word jingo does come from a song. Um, and it was a song about uh, is a song about British patriotism and the fact that if other countries gave the British trouble, that they uh, they would uh, you know go to war. Such people were called jingoist or jingos. And so yeah, that's what a jingo was. A person who was in favor of war to uh, to acquire goals for the British. Okay, a couple more things. I know uh, we're running a little bit long on time, uh, but not that much. So Britain and Russia sat down and talked about conflicting interests in the Balkans and the Mediterranean, and that was reviewed at the Congress of Berlin. In July of 1878, the Congress of Berlin was, was uh, called under the presidency of Otto von Bismarck, who said the Eastern question, meaning this whole controversy about uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, who should own the, the uh, Bosporus and the Dardanelles. Out of on Bismarck said, we got no interest here. He said his direct quote was, the Eastern question was not worth the bones of one healthy Pomeranian musketeer. You say, what's a healthy Pomeranian musketeer? A musketeer is somebody with a gun. Uh, Pomeranian is a region, Pomerania is a region within the old Prussian Empire. And so he said, we ain't getting into a fight for that. Uh, however, the Congress of Berlin did not go Russia's way. Bulgaria, who had been a Russian supporter, was reduced, made smaller by two thirds, and was deprived of its access to the Aegean Sea. Austria was also given right, and this will be an important part. Austria was given the right to administer Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was a Slavic territory, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, even though it, Bosnia-Herzegovina, remained under uh, uh, Ottoman control. So Austria got to run it. The Ottoman, control, Ottoman Empire said, we own it. Uh, Russia, I'm sorry, Britain received the island of Cyprus. Uh, and France was encouraged to occupy Tunisia. Germany asked for nothing, but the Russians were still hacked off at them. Russians believe that they had saved Prussia in 1807 by defeating Napoleon, and they expected some gratitude. And after this, the Dreikaiserbund, the Three Emperors League that Otto von Bismarck had worked so hard for, was now dead. Romania wanted Bessarabia, another province which Russia kept. Bulgaria, of course, wanted its property, its two-thirds of its property back. Uh, I hope I never find out who G-Max is or they're going to be in real serious trouble. Uh, but anyway, back to the matter at hand. Um, the greatest trouble spot, however, was Montenegro and Serbia, uh, who, once again, in Montenegro and Serbia, greatly resented the Austrian presence in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I'll tell you what, we've gone 30 minutes now, and that would be about a normal class period. And we will end here and pick up with part G tomorrow. Uh, part G. And so, yes. If you have any questions, please leave comments in the comment zone. Thank you so much. Have a good day.